Welcome to Joy in the Breakthrough, a podcast where we'll be talking to a wide range of leaders from different generations and backgrounds who have found power in being broken open. I'm Connie Lindsay. And I'm Anna Valencia. We are your hosts and we believe that our challenges can lead to breakthroughs. And we wanna share those insights with you. We hope these stories will inspire you to explore the I'm possible in you. Thank you for joining us. We heard you were um, coming straight from the house floor. So we know how busy your time is and we're just so great. We're just so grateful that you said yes to this. Um, I'm going to do a little quick bio of you, but before I do, I just want to tell our listeners um, how this came about because okay. Connie and I are big on manifesting and okay. we oh went to this personal pack event and it's a small room and a lot of women in the room and, and men allies and we heard you speak and we're just blown away. That's my first time hearing you in person speak. And I love how authentic you are and just, you're not talking points. You're, you're just very generous and gracious with your time with everyone. And right after the event, and this is where Connie and I talk <laughs> about being courageous and bold and, and going after you know what you want in life and making that ask even when it's, it could be difficult. I remember going right up and I said to Connie and our producer, Anna Deshaun, I was like, let's go and ask her to be on the podcast. Exactly. (laughs) It might be a long shot, but let's do it. And you were so gracious to say yes. So um, to our listeners, if you don't ask. You don't get. You don't get. You don't know. So I'm just going to open it up. The old adage, closed mouths don't get fed. That's it. So. (laughs) So that's it. You know, and uh, no, and uh, I think uh, I believe deeply in alignment. And so, um, you know, here we are. Exactly. Yes, I do believe in alignment. And then I saw you this summer somewhere, too. And I was like, I'm not yes. stalking you. I think this is who you are. And you are so nice. <laughs> um, so I just want to give a little bit of our listeners who may not be familiar with you um, if they're living under a rock and don't know you because <laughs> you are a rock star. Um Ayana was the first woman of color elected to the Boston City Council first in 100 years. When I read that, I was like, wow, we have so much work to do. She was the first Mm -hmm. woman elected to Congress from the Commonwealth, uh, woman of color elected to Congress from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. She describes herself as an activist, legislator, and survivor. Um, For many of you who may not know this, uh, she actually has roots in Chicago. Her mom was a community organizer at the Chicago Urban League, which Mm -hmm. Connie and I love, and they throw an amazing gala here. And I sit on the board of the Chicago Urban League, so your mom left a a wonderful legacy, has a wonderful legacy with us as well. And one of, um, we love this mantra, and and I wanna share it with everyone. Connie and I just like felt it in our soul when we read it, is bringing the people closest to the pain, closest to the power which drives and informs your legislative policy making process. And um, Connie, I know it's gonna open with our first question, but that really resonated with both of us. Well, once again, we just wanna welcome you and thank you for taking time out of your incredibly important, impactful and busy schedule to join us. Um, Anna told our listeners a little bit about your background. My first question is how did your upbringing influence who you are and lead you to your why that you're living right now? Um, you know, it all began uh, with my mother. I think that's the most important part of my resume. And just to give you a sense of the sort of soil with which I am rooted. My mother, um, there was a certain point where she was mid-career. Uh, she had been laid off and she had started taking different uh, tech and computer classes and things like that to be more competitive in the workplace. And uh, it was a very demoralizing experience because ageism is very real. Uh, You know, people are living longer by uh, the grace of God and medical advances. Uh, And sadly, because of, you know, social constructs uh, and particularly for black women also working longer. I mean, retirement doesn't even seem like a real option. And um, so she asked me to look at her resume to give her some feedback. And I was looking at her resume and I said, Mommy, and I'm not ashamed to say that even in my adult years, uh, she she was Mommy. And I said, you know, Mommy, here's your problem. The first thing that you have on this resume is that you are uh, Ayanna Presley's mom. <laughs> and, 
you know, I, I'm mommy, I'm nobody. I'm your child, you know, your your only child, your baby girl. Um I, I'm I'm an aide, you know, to an elected official whom I respect and you respect, but that means nothing to no one. Like you need to take that off. People probably think you're very eccentric. And she said, you can change anything that you want on this, but that stays oh, because yeah. being your mother is my greatest achievement. So I wanted to share that just uh, to give people a sense of the soil with which I'm rooted. Mm -hmm. So I had a mother who loved me fiercely and who was a unapologetically proud black woman uh, my first coloring book was uh, inspired or produced rather by the uh, Chicago Defender. And I remember uh, coloring uh, the images of black children with afros with their fists uh, saying nation time. And so my mother told me early on, you know, to be black is a beautiful thing, something uh, I want you to be proud of. But you have been born into a struggle and I have an expectation that you will do your part in the struggle. Uh, in the work of liberation of black people and other marginalized people. And that might sound like a lot to place uh, on the shoulders of, of a child, but because my mother raised me alone, my father uh, you know, is a brilliant man and has gone on to do incredible things as a college professor and a published author. But for many years, he was in the throes of addiction and in and out of the criminal legal system. So my mother was raising me alone. So it felt very much like it was my mother and I versus the world. So for those reasons, she never patronized or or, or placated me. I was like a little human, you know? <laughs> so uh, the final thing I would just say on that, and it is for those reasons based on those dynamics, that I saw the humanity of my mother early on because it was just the two of us. And so I was there when she went through breakups. I was there when she was devastated that she trained white men that were promoted over her. I knew about that. I was there when she was in great pain physically from uterine fibroids. And we didn't even really understand what that was and, and why it was so extreme. And she had to have a hysterectomy uh, early and then uh, went back to work too soon because there's no paid leave and um, collapsed on the street. Mm. Um, you know, I was aware of the fact that I was very young and a latchkey kid, you know, taking care of myself without uh, babysitters when my mother ha had to work late hours and that that was to be a secret, but she couldn't afford childcare. But she was afraid if people knew that, that she would lose custody of me. So it's it's all of those things that gave me a sense of my mother as a woman, a black woman, outside of her being my mother. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of children, it takes many years for them to see their parents' uh, humanity, but I knew my mother's struggle. Um, and so it was this interesting dichotomy to have this unapologetically proud black woman who fought fiercely for me to ensure that I'd be deprived and denied, not an opportunity, worked multiple jobs so that I could go to Francis Parker and Lincoln Park School and be on a trajectory in life. And yet for all of her strength, for all of her, uh, her brilliance, uh, she was still living in marginalization and she was also a survivor of, of domestic violence. So I was also privy to that. So I saw my mother, someone trying to beat um, everything out of her, her humanity, her self-esteem, her self-worth. And so those experiences married with the fact that my mother was a proud Democrat and a super voter and took me with her to vote in every single election. And also um, a woman of unwavering faith that of a mustard seed that I saw move mountains in my life every day to provide for us. So it's the confluence of all of those things, being rooted in that soil, being rooted in the church, seeing the injustices my mother lived with, and then going to Parker. Yeah. Uh, yes. All right. of these things have set me on this, this pathway of service, and in particular of advocacy, of, of the most marginalized. And because my mother was a super voter 
and would we would read the paper together and watch Sunday shows together, I learned early on that what was the foundational to many of these inequities was federal policy. So that never left me. So I know I've offered a lot there. It's probably obvious that I'm the granddaughter of a Baptist preacher. <laughs> uh, and my grandfather, the, the Reverend James E. Eccles, who uh, pastored a storefront church on the south side of Chicago, may he rest in peace and power. My mother, who transitioned, you know, some 11 years ago, uh, may she rest in peace and power. Um, but that's uh, how I've arrived uh, in this place. I think it's amazing because it does give the story of how you came to be who you are. And as you were talking, I was reminded of a song we sang in church, like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. And, and yeah. you embody all of that, both in the narrative of your life and just, I honor you for the transparency in you sharing that. It really strengthens a lot of us who have similar lived experiences, but might not necessarily share them as eloquently as you do, but you are touching so many people by telling your story and we thank you for that. What's up, Chicago? I'm Darius Caffey, and I invite you to join me for our season finale episode of The Table On Air with our first returning guests and our show creative director, Terrell Stanley. You are one of the large reasons that I came out to my parents is because I was in love with you. Join the conversation with us on Tuesday, December 5th at 7.30 p.m. on Can TV Cable Channel 19, streaming on CanTV.org and available on the Can TV Plus app. Experience the power of community television. You touched something in my heart. You're talking about your mom having to kind of start over when um, maybe midlife and career. And my mother at age 60, um, I always tell, I said this in another episode, my mom could have been a CEO of a company, right? A Fortune 500 company had she been born in a different era and maybe had more opportunities, but she didn't. She didn't have the opportunity to go to college and um, her family could not afford it. And so at 60, she worked as a teacher's aide at a nonprofit and wow. made maybe $20,000 at the height of her career. And the budget cuts happened in Illinois under a Republican governor, of course. And they came in and said, you know, if you don't have your master's, if you don't have your college degree, you know, take away 20 years of experience, you're gone. So at age 60, she was forced out. And I remember seeing on her the, the just the self-esteem drop her self-confidence, everything. And it was heartbreaking to watch and have her try to kind of recover of what she would do next. And then also the financial impact on my parents, because my dad is also a retired union painter now. So what would happen if she had to draw into Social Security early or all these things? And so like you and your mom, I understand how that feels. And sometimes the reverse of um, becoming, I don't want to say caretaker, but seeing your, your parents humanity um, is so, that's, it comes to you sometimes at an earlier age than others. So Yes, absolutely. And that is why, um, you know, BIPOC children by and large are um, adultified exactly. at such an accelerated rate um, because of what we're proximate to. Um, and also, you know, what we experience as well, which is why I'm a firm believer that resilience is romanticized and highly overrated. It comes from great hardship, you know. Yes. Um, but um, ageism is very real. And it's an issue that I have because of my exposure to that. Now that I serve as the vice chair of the task force on aging and families, uh, it's an issue that I've uh, made a priority. And anytime I'm doing civil rights work, and we are talking about discrimination, I ask that it's it's included. So um, I'm always drawing from those lived experiences. And I think that further makes the case for why a representative government matters. It's not for contrived moments of kumbaya. It's not for better looking pictures, though, you know, I'm pretty cute. It's, um, <laughs> for sure. You know, it's um, because, you know, we call the question, um, yes. you know, a different question than that of if policymakers are all working from the same myopic view, monolithic, homogenized viewpoint. You need that diversity of perspective, opinion, and thought, and lived experience because we'll call different questions. And then that uh, diversifies the issues that are championed and the policies that are advanced. And as we watch and pay attention to the work that you do legislatively, um, as a sister who's moved into that um, modern elder category, 
I'm always <laughs> delighted when I hear you say that. And as I've said before, I define a modern elder who is a person who is as curious as she is wise. So thank I you love for, for helping us I to love do that. that. <laughs> Listen, y'all, I'm closer to that than the other. In February, <laughs> I turn, February, I turned 50, you know, All so. Right. Exactly. You know, I'm in full on perimenopause. If y'all want to have me come back and talk about that, it's this has huge. been a personal ministry of mine because um, we do not get the education. My my comms director who's on the line right now, uh, he, he's a man. He's not even flinching because I have been talking to anyone who will listen. Why didn't anyone tell us? It's you know, so true. There are so many more things, but y'all have me back some other time. We That's definitely the will. I'm calling it marvelous woman of pause because we're not men and we're not pausing. So it's marvelous okay. woman of pause. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like a rebrand. Okay. <laughs> Connie's right. always, Connie's yeah. always the rebrander. And this is why we have these, our pod is different. We wanted to have an intergenerational conversation. So Connie and I have been co-mentoring each other. And when we started this podcast, because we want to have these conversations um, through, the, through the whole span, right? Because we know women are thinking these things and we need a space to, to talk about it and be honest and transparent. And so I wanted to get to a little bit about you too, about part of this is too, is about telling us when there might've been a moment, a pivotal moment or a, a time that you felt like you might break open to only find yourself breakthrough to joy on the other side. And how, is there a moment you could share with our audience that you had in your long span of your, of your life? Okay, I, I wanna be mindful of time. I'm gonna give three. I'm gonna list them, but I probably won't editorialize them, okay? Okay. But okay. if there's a pointed question you have about any of them, that's fine. Okay, so um, the first is when I was running for the Boston City Council, um, when I had an epiphany that I could run authentically as myself. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, had done an interview and when it was over, the interviewer told me, I was really looking forward to interviewing you. You're so animated, so interesting. But the second the camera turned on, you turned off. And um, I watched the interview back and I realized that I was being performative, uh, not in a way that was not uh, genuine, but that I was replicating the mannerisms, the affect, the verbiage, the tonality of the white men that I had worked for. Yes, I didn't I know that. that I could be me. I mm. thought that what I had to do was demonstrate my fluency mm -hmm. um, in sort of the signaling that shows I understand this world and how I'm to move. I mean, I aged myself. I was wearing ascots. I don't even know if y'all know what that is, but I was like in, you know, just heavy oh, yeah. brooches and shawls yeah. and anything, you know, and I was, very young, but I thought I had to age myself to be taken seriously. And I thought I had to take on this persona. Yeah. And so when I, when I realized uh, in that moment that I could actually just be myself, I didn't have to put on a mm. character mm -hmm. that was incredibly freeing. There was a yes. breakthrough. in that. The second is um, certainly with my alopecia. For those of you who don't know, I live uh, with the autoimmune disease uh, alopecia. I actually have alopecia totalis. Mm -hmm. So I was robbed of all the hair on my head, my face and my body in about a five week period. Mm -hmm. It was a transformation, not of my choosing um, and very hard, although it doesn't threaten my life. That doesn't mean it doesn't affect it. Um, I experience, uh, you know, bullying, discrimination, harassment. It's very disruptive for people. Um, a bald black woman it challenges societal and conventional norms of what is appropriate, what is professional, what is feminine, what is pretty. Um, but it's been a th breakthrough for me because I had been so focused on what I was losing, especially after I had spent many years growing my hair out, wearing natural protective styles, loving that, feeling in alignment. When I grew my hair out, from chemically relaxing it and then saw myself in the mirror and then was wearing Senegalese like waist long twist. It was, I felt like I met myself for the first time, you know? So I'd been in this hate relationship with, with my texture in my hair. And then I was finally there. And so it was very hard to make that transition, but I'd been so focused on what I was losing mm. that I didn't realize what I would gain. Yes. And I gained, yes an alopecia community. And my husband actually said, um, 
you know, it's your choice. If you want to wear a wig, you know, I support you. I love you no matter what. He said, but in my opinion, alopecia did not rob you of your beauty. It revealed it. it. He said, uh, inside and out, I can see uh, your cheekbones now and your the shape of your eyes. And, you know, and he said, so, you know, baby, you don't need hair to rock a crown. Mm. So that w- that was a huge breakthrough. So I'll, since I did unpack them a little bit, I won't go to the third and I'll just end there. Yeah. Well, I think when you when you talk about hair, um, the Crown Act, mm-hmm. we, we could not have you here and not talk about the Crown Act. The, the comments that you made on the floor were tremendous. Share with our listeners a little bit or as much as you can about the Crown mm-hmm. Act and the passing of that, which is liberating for so many black women in particular around sure. our hair. Sure. Well, you know, I got a lot of hate about that, you know, actually, because people just didn't understand. Um, look, if you're not marginalized, you don't understand that we have to legislate and litigate That's for right. all the things that are a birthright for you. That's mm-hmm. it. That's it. Navigate the world exactly as you entered it and to do something as simple as wearing your hair as it grows out of your head, okay? So we have to litigate and legislate that which is a birthright for others, in particular, cis white men. So um, the Crown Act is uh, federal legislation, but there's also numerous uh, state bills. Um, In fact, uh, I think, uh, so I have to have somebody give me a note to get it correct, but um, how many states have, have passed the Crown Act? Massachusetts is among is among them, but so a number of states have passed the Crown Act. It's it's banning race based hair discrimination, and so if you experience race based hair discrimination for wearing your hair uh, in in locks, in twists, in an afro with extensions, uh, a weave, a, you know, a baldy, whatever and you believe you didn't get an interview because of it, or you weren't promoted because of it, or you were fired because of it, in any way you experienced discrimination, now you have grounds uh, really for legal uh, recourse because it is a violation of your civil rights. It It is against the law. So we haven't passed it federally yet. It passed the House. Uh, the Crown Act to ban race-based hair discrimination, but it has not passed the Senate. But again, it is making great traction in states uh, throughout the country. And I would just say that it liberated so many women. I spent my career in corporate America and so many black women became comfortable saying, Connie, is it okay if I wear my braids to a board Mm. meeting? And just as you've said, that is who you are come as you are, it does not affect your brilliance. So thank you and all those who work to let people see us truly as who we are, because there's power in that. Yes. There's just absolutely. power in that. Yeah, yeah sure. absolutely. And I know we're at time, but I want to end with one little question, that, one question we like to ask all of our, our listeners. How do you define joy? So um, anyone who knows me knows that the thing I read the most is poetry. And more than any political biographies, I mean, I read my briefs. I do my homework every day, okay? <laughs> and don't, get, don't get me wrong about that. And I read the news. But outside of that, my favorite thing to read is, is poetry. And so Maya Angelou has been a huge, uh, has had a huge impact and uh, on my life. And I had this um, rare experience where we were both in a green room at the same time going to do an interview. And I timidly, meekly approached her. And um, we, we exchanged some words. And then I asked her if she would autograph something for me. And all she wrote on it was joy, mm. oh, exclamation wow. point. And then she signed it. And to be honest, outside of, I mean, there were very few, it's really fairly recent that people even use the word joy, if you really think about it. Sure. So this happened, you know, 25 plus years ago. And I was like, joy, you know, here she is, an author, a scholar, an orator, a poet. She could have written anything and she wrote joy. Mm-hmm. And a, a dear friend framed that for me later and I still have it to this day. But so what is joy to me? It is something that is enduring and that uh, when you have it, 
you must fight like hell to preserve it. Yes. I used to say that joy is an act of resistance. And I won't pretend that that's not true, but I don't say that today because it still is your joy being in the utility of labor. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we deserve to be joyful. We deserve black joy. We deserve to just be without agenda, without utility, beyond our labor. We deserve that sort of enduring peace that comes with real joy. We love that. Amen to that. Thank you, because we, Connie and I office often say happiness is fleeting, and so that yes. is why joy is our word for joy in the breakthrough. It yes. is that deep sense, and for yes. different interviews, people define it differently. differently. But but we, you brought us joy. You brought us so much By joy, sharing who you so are much with us. joy in our hearts and, and our soul. Grateful. And thank you so much for taking the time and for saying yes. We will never forget it. And next time you're in Chicago, please let Connie and I know. Um, we'd love to take you to our favorite spots um, or hang. You know that. You know that. And I and I have to say, without getting emotional, thank you to um, Chicago, to the city that raised me. Oh. Truly, the city of Chicago gave me my roots and my wings. Mm -hmm. And I would, um, you know, certainly uh, that married with the um, the extraordinary love of my mother yes. uh, and our abiding faith. And our enduring joy is is why I'm in Congress today. So thank you, Chi Town. Thank, thank you. you for letting your life speak. Thank you, Blessings. Congresswoman. Blessings. Take yes. Care. Take care. This was an amazing episode. Uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley was everything for us and more. And we're going to close out on a very strong "Say Less" from Connie because when you say less, you say more. So Connie, what do you have with, after this inspiring conversation? You're right, I'm still just totally vibrating from that exchange, <laughs> the authenticity and the joy that came yes, through. The There's joy. something about that. So what came to mind for me as I thought about our conversation and hopefully what this segment will mean for our listeners was letting your life speak. Parker Palmer wrote a book called Let Your Life Speak. And when I heard Congresswoman Presley talk about her life, she was letting it speak but in a way that was most eloquent because of her, her candor and transparency. So my question for you is how will you let your life speak? Understanding and realizing that being truly who you are is the power that can propel you to the impossible in you. Thank you, Connie, again, to bring it to be in an eloquent way to end our show. So we hope that you join us for Join the Fight Breakthrough again on Monday evenings, and we'll be actually on our episodes Monday evenings at 7 p.m. live chatting. So join us on YouTube, ch ch check us out, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. We lo love that. Amen. To that. Thank you, because Connie and I all